us about that, that we could partner with you, that we'd be ready, Lord, that we would not have this day catch us unaware, like you said to Sardis. Lord, we don't want the realities that you want done in the earth, Lord, to, to fall to the ground or be handed to someone else. We want to be the people that agree with you. We want to be your body. So would you help us to do that tonight? Just start to get vision for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So Galatians study part one. If you would have asked me last year, Tom, are you going to be doing something on the book of Galatians? I would have been like, what? No way. But the Lord's really been talking to me about Galatians um, and how it's important that we study it um, with some real intention. So that's the point. Now, the point, um, similar to some studies we've done in the past, is not to go line by line. I think there's lots of good studies out there already that are line by line. If you're interested in that, a lot of the historical stuff about Galatians and the, you know, there's, there's several interesting realities about Galatians that are worth informing ourselves about. For instance, the way that Galatians has been used throughout Reformation movements, you know, throughout the church history, ever since the a couple hundred years after Jesus uh, rose again from the dead, there were already the need for Reformation movements in the church. And Galatians is typically the the book of the Bible that gets referenced when a Reformation starts to happen. Luther's Reformation relied heavily on the book of Galatians. There's just tons of really great anecdotal and important um, revelations about, you know, the things that you could study, that you could look on Wikipedia and find out. And I'm not going to cover any of that stuff. I mean, there's just a couple of sentences in the notes tonight. What I feel like the Lord is really highlighting is why Paul wrote the book of Galatians how it's relevant to us, and what it connects to in the Bible. So we're going to study the book of Galatians pretty intently, but the most important thing is that we're all individually reading Galatians so that the stuff that we talk about when we meet together, it's relevant to things that we're already thinking about. Otherwise, it'd still be, interest, it'd still be helpful to you, I think, but it won't be a really good study of Galatians unless you're actually studying Galatians because the messages I'm going to release are to help you study Galatians. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So there was some homework that I released uh, last week. Hopefully uh, you had a little time to do that. I'll try to keep it really short and easy to do in like 15, 20 minutes, um, maybe a half hour at the most. But I'll try to do that so that you have a whole week to do a half hour's worth of stuff because I know you guys are all very busy. Um, and so I'm not trying to load you down with a bunch of stuff to do, but this will help us keep connected to why we're, why we're talking about the stuff we're talking about each week. And so obviously the homework for last week was really all about faith. And, and a lot of it was kind of heavy on Hebrews 11, which is one of the most important books of the Bible to understand biblical faith. And that's the title of the, of the message tonight is Biblical Faith Versus Works. And we'll jump right in. Item one, Galatians is a defense of the true gospel or good news. That's what Paul, that's why Paul was writing it because there was a false gospel that was starting to circulate and it was a gospel that was actually based on the, the laws of the Judaic laws. Like these guys were starting to turn to the Judaic laws instead of the gospel that Paul had preached and that all of the, the apostles were preaching. Okay. So Galatians is a letter from Paul, the apostle to several churches. That's one of the interesting facts about the book of Galatians is that it's one of the only letters Paul wrote that was to many churches. And all these churches were in, in a very specific region. Most scholars say the area is called Anatolia, which is basically the same area that the seven churches are in that Jesus uh, has John write the letter to in Revelation 2 and 3. So Paul's, Paul's writing to, to people that aren't Jews in this area, which is now in Turkey. So the Galatians, the reason they're called Galatians is because they were from a place called Gaul. Galatians were Celtic people who migrated to what is now Western Turkey via a place called Thrace. And I'm, I'm giving you some, some geographical names that you maybe can't really relate to because they're not used that often anymore. But that area is now occupied by Bulgaria, kind of as the north boundary, and Istanbul will be the south. So Istanbul is one of the north, northernmost points of Turkey where Turkey kind of meets Greece. So from that area all the way to about mid-Bulgaria, that was an area called Thrace. Now, so the Celtic people, that means they came from Northern Europe. They were Northern Europeans that had migrated down to Thrace, and then they came into Turkey, and they lived in the area, the, the basically the same region as the seven churches. They were foreigners. Like, they were not only not Jews, they weren't from that area at all. Like, they were transplants. They had moved because of various political alliances and, and socioeconomic and military realities had moved them basically from 
Ireland, England, in Northern Europe down into this area. Okay, so it's important to understand, the, the main reason I'm pointing all this out is, it's important to understand that Galatians, they were non-Jewish, okay? Now, Paul, he was writing to Gentiles in the book of Galatians, but that's usually who's Paul, who Paul is writing to in all of his letters. He was an apostle to the Gentiles, but it's important to keep this fact straight when you read the book of Galatians, that he's not talking to, you know, Jewish people who kind of like did Christianity for a minute and then were going back to Judaism. That's not what was happening. He's writing to people who were never Jews, who became believers in Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, and then went from that into trying to obey Mosaic law. Do you see what I'm saying? That'd be like us being non-Jews, getting saved, and then being like, I'm really interested in the Jewish roots of Jesus, and we start doing Jewish stuff, and pretty soon we've got this weird ritualistic, traditional mix of Judaism and Christianity. We do not want to do that, though it's very important to understand Jewish history, culture, and tradition. Do you see what I'm saying? This, this is talking to us. Like a lot of people in the charismatic church in our day, are like in the place that Paul is actually talking about in the book of Galatians, including some of us, you know, me, including me. I get real excited about Jewish days, Jewish, and that's really good until you start making it like your main mode of interacting with God in worship and like he's, he's only talking through Jewish dates or Jewish feasts or Jewish festivals. It's very easy to do this, okay? Because the flesh... The flesh basically wants the easiest way possible to know that we're hearing God. So we kind of go to the easiest thing to touch, taste, feel our senses, our five senses. And what Paul is actually calling the Galatians to is to not take the lazy way through this, to actually learn how to hear God, which is very difficult. It takes a lot more energy to hear God than for somebody to tell you about feasts and festivals and start connecting with that. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I think, too, the flesh really likes tradition and ceremony and, you know, like tangible things. It that, feels safe. And feels like you're connecting with, like, the sure things that something I connect with real. God. Yeah. Yes, very good. Yeah, absolutely. Our flesh likes something touchy, real. That is generally the opposite of the faith the Bible's calling us to, okay? But in faith, these things matter. So it's a very narrow road. We'll get more into that tonight. Okay, so it's important to understand that Galatians were non-Jewish people. Paul was writing to Gentiles, as is usual for Paul's writing. Item D, the central question being answered in the book of Galatians is salvation by grace alone. That's a typo. It shouldn't say alone. Grace alone. Or salvation by keeping Mosaic law, which we could also insert works. James writes a similar treatise about works you can't ignore, you can't live a life without actually doing things that agree with God's leadership as understood by, by creation. You know, that's really what the law, the law is highlighting um, our, what God, the level of detail God wants in our interactive, in our lives, the level of detail he wants to be included in our lives. And so I'm using a lot of words to say works are very important and Paul's not writing this off. Okay. So the central question being answered in the book of Galatians is salvation by grace. This was a central misunderstanding in the entire church in, in Paul's day, both in Jerusalem. Now, where do we hear about this misunderstanding about, is it all about the Jewish tradition and the circumcision, or is it about like God's releasing this to the Gentiles and they don't have to obey Jewish law? Where do, where's another place we might see that in the book of Acts, for instance, Acts 15. Acts 15 is where... James says, I mean, we talk about this passage quite a bit, which is why I'm bringing it up. That's the passage where James says, all the prophets prophesied the tabernacle of David. We shouldn't hold these Gentile believers to the Jewish law. We should just say, you know, have them not eat meat with blood in it, abstain from sexual impurity. And, you know, we know this is about the tabernacle of David. The reason I'm saying this is the book of Galatians is actually about the tabernacle of David. And I want you to just, I don't want to tell you why just yet. I think you probably, you probably can figure it out, but it's very important to understand what Paul is actually talking about in the book of Galatians is the throne room of God, getting into the secret place and hearing God. That is the tabernacle of David. That's why David set up the tabernacle was to have the Holy Spirit come down through prophetic singers and tell Israel what to do. That's what Paul's talking about in the book of Galatians is a spirit led life, which only happens in the reality of, in, of going boldly before the throne of grace in this new and living way, stirring up each other to love and good works, even more so as we see the day approaching. That is the tabernacle of David, Hebrews 10, okay? 
So this was a central misunderstanding, though, throughout the entire church at this time period. And we see that with, with the, the disciples um, or the apostles kind of arguing about what to do with uh, non-Jewish Christians in Acts 15. So the first Gentile Christians, non-Jewish Christians, they were considered to have converted to Judaism. In the early church, like for the first couple hundred, hundred years, if you became a Christian, because all of the first Christians were Jewish, it was like you were converting to Judaism. You were just converting into Messianic Judaism. Like you, you were converting to Judaism, believing the Messiah for Israel had come, which is true. Like it's unfortunate that we live in a time period where we see Christians as different than grafted into Israel. Okay, we have to actually kind of get out of our Western mindset where there's like Christians and then there's Israel and Israel's going to become Christians. That's not true. Christians are grafted into Israel and together we're going to become a bride as we see Jesus for who he really is. Okay, and what, who he really is is a Jewish king. So when we signed up to follow Jesus, we signed up to be joined together forever to a Jewish man as part of a Jewish man's body. Okay, because we're his, his body on the earth. So let's read Romans eleven thirteen to 21. It's very important. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now what he's really saying is, it's, a, it's incredible that they're being cast away has made this space for the gospel to go out, you know, because Jewish people rejected Jesus in mass and, and actually asked Rome to kill him. And Jesus said that that's actually going to be an opportunity for the gospel to go to the whole world. And Paul's saying, that's amazing, but this can't be finished until their acceptance comes. That's where the life from the dead is going to happen. So our our experience of Jesus's return, our own salvation, our part in the first resurrection, Jesus getting a bride, the millennial reign, all of this is tied to Jewish people being accepting Jesus and then the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so it's like we can't just kind of be like, yeah, you know, that Jewish thing is interesting. That, that Jewish thing is us thing. That's an us thing. Okay. And if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Now, I want to go back to verse 20. He says, well said. That's true. Israel was the, the natural branches. There was some space made for you by their being broken off from this root. He says, that's true. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. So Paul lays out this theology over and over and over. This is the same theology that he's laying out in Galatians, this same idea. So I, I, as we kind of study Galatians, it's important to kind of look, okay, where else does Paul talk about faith? Because if you take faith in the flesh, you will miss what Paul is saying to both in, in the, this chapter in Romans 11, in Galatians. If you take faith as being just trust God and you don't have to do anything, that's not biblical faith. That's earthly, fleshly faith. That's got nothing to do with what Paul's talking about. Ta Paul is talking about hearing God and doing what he says to do. Paul's equation would be faith equals praying always plus obeying. Okay, that's Paul's faith. Talking to God, hearing what he says, believing what he says. That's the faith he's talking about is believing God, believing in his character, that what he says to you is actually the good way to get the thing that you're, you want in your heart, and then obeying God even though his, his leadership is illogical to the flesh. That is the faith that Paul's talking about, not Hey, you know what? Just trust God. You're, everything's going to be fine. You don't have to do anything. Just enjoy God. That's a false gospel. That's not real. And that's part of what Paul is addressing in Galatians. But most people that read Galatians, they think, oh, I'm actually supposed to just be like trusting God and not doing anything too hard. Don't want to try and earn God's love by doing the law. That's not what Paul is saying, though he's not saying that you can do that either. Paul is saying something in the narrow road that is 
you have to be supernaturally changed. You have to have the humility that recognizes God cast out the unfaithful. And then you have to give yourself to asking him to connect you in gratitude and faith to obedience. That's what Israel didn't do when Jesus came, was obey God. And so we have to be a people that obey God. But if you read Galatians in the flesh, you'd be like, no, he's saying you don't have to obey God, right? Because he's saying you don't have to turn to that Mosaic law. That's not what it's about. It's about faith. Most people read Galatians in the flesh and they start to get themselves out of the very thing Paul is trying to lead us into, which is extreme, wholehearted. Extreme isn't even the right word because it's just basic Christianity, but it's wholehearted obedience. That's what Paul is teaching in Galatians is wholehearted obedience. And I want you to check me on this. I want you to look through Galatians and see is what Paul's saying. Is it calling me to more holiness or less holiness? And you'll see really clearly it's calling you to more holiness, not less. Okay. Now, biblically or theologically, Christians, what we would call Christians, are basically what we would now call Messianic Jews in law. So like son-in-law. I am my mother-in-law's son-in-law. When we sign up to get ready to marry Jesus, we're getting ready to be joined to a Jewish man or Jewish king. All the first believers were Jewish. Misunderstanding this reality, because a lot of people think when they read things like Romans 11 or read the book of Galatians, and, and, and primarily Galatians, that what Jesus is, is actually doing is replacing Jewish people with the church. Like the, the old, old covenant doesn't matter. Jewish law doesn't matter. There's this whole new reality. Get with Jesus. It does, your Jewish history doesn't matter. Your Jewish roots don't matter. The tradition doesn't matter. The festivals don't matter. That's not what Paul is saying. He's actually saying the exact opposite. He's, he lays out in Galatians that we are supposed to be one with Jewish people, not moving on past them. This idea that the church has replaced Israel, the reason I'm making such a big deal about it is that this is what led the Nazis to kill Jewish people. It's called replacement theology. If you start to think God's done with the Jewish people, they can join us if they want to, but he's just, you know, Christianity is the new Israel or the Israel of God. That's not true. That's a very dangerous apostasy or deception that's led to the death of many, many people. And so we have to stay in this narrow road where it's exactly like Paul laid it out. Branches were broken off for me. If in humility, I realize I'm grafted into Israel and I do not replace her. She supports me and I'm supposed to learn how to be one with her through being one with God. Okay. That's the, the narrow, humble place that Galatians is calling us to and Romans 11. Okay. Now misunderstanding this reality has led to a lot of evil. I just talked about that. This means Israel's warnings and persecutions. If you're grafted into her, and you're humble, though all the warnings in the Old Testament are for the church. They really are. Also, all the promises for Israel are for the church. They really are. This means practically. A lot of people say this to me. So, you know, they'll get reading in the Old Testament prophets. They'll be like, well, was that just for Israel? Or, or sometimes we'll pray things. We'll be like, well, you know, I don't want to co-opt the promise to Israel. But the truth is, all the promises are yours if you're a Christian because you're grafted into Israel. And when one part suffers, the whole thing suffers. When one part's honored, the whole thing is honored. But the idea is like kind, lesser measure. You don't replace Israel. Like God's not going to give you the promise that he gave to Solomon. You know, that, that's one of the places where people are like, I don't know if we could pray this one. You know, if my people were called by my name, humble themselves. Well, the ultimate expression of that is Israel repenting, seeing the one they pierced mourning him, like that's the ultimate expression, but we can do that too because we're grafted into that same root. We have the same sins. We take God for granted in the same way. We have the same assumptions. We think we're, you know, children of Abraham, so we don't have to do all this stuff. We are grafted into the same warnings, but also the same promises. But in humility, we say, okay, like kind, lesser measure. What is the lesser measure? I don't know. No one knows. We're supposed to assume that that's our family and we share. It's, a, it's being an in-law. You know, an in-law assumes, all right, this is my family, for better or for worse. All of the problems this family suffers, I suffer. All the inheritance, I inherit. And that's true for an in-law, okay? Now, this means uh, understanding the central tenet of the gospel. This will unlock the entire Bible as applicable to us, which it is. This, starting to walk into what I'm describing, it will make Isaiah a book for you. Isaiah is one of the most difficult books to understand because people are always like, did that happen? Is that going to happen? Is that just for Israel? Is that for the church? Yes, 
The answer is yes to all of those things. And when you embrace this humble reality that you became a Jewish person when you said yes to marrying Jesus, that then it makes all this stuff makes sense and it will help you sort it out, okay? The true gospel is reconciling all enmity or all division. So if you hear a gospel that is growing enmity or division, that's not the real gospel. Now, you might say, well, Tom, if you accept the gospel, people are going to be mad. Jesus said, I came to bring division as a sword. Yes, he did. But for people that obey the gospel, they actually forgive the enemies that are trying to kill them. The, the, the erasing of the enmity happens on the Jesus side of the equation. Do you see what I'm saying? So the true gospel, it's erasing all the enmity, but it also provokes people to hate the erasing of the enmity. You get what I'm saying? Very important. So if you're believing, hey, the gospel says we're supposed to, you know, go after those people or, you know, tell those people how dumb they are. That's not the true gospel. The true gospel means I take up a cross and I bear the reproach of actually believing God's erasing the enmity all around me if I'll just stay faithful to his heart standards. Okay, this is super important. So, okay, so Galatians 3, 26 to 29. We're going to start to take bits and pieces from Galatians because tonight I'm just kind of laying out the foundation you have to approach Galatians from to get the biblical viewpoint. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ to put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now this, this passage should really upset the Southern Baptist Convention, who's like, women shouldn't teach. Well, according to Paul, like, when you put on Christ... There is no real male or female. Like, and, and the point is not that we should just rush in the flesh to, all right, there's no, eminent, there's no enmity, there's no division anymore, but we're supposed to be getting a vision for when Jesus is done with the gospel, there's going to be no division between people. Like women will teach just like men. That's what the Garden of Eden was like this. Jesus is actually undoing the curse. So we've taught a little bit here about why it's appropriate for women to teach. This is one of the main reasons is because you have to, you have to look at what Jesus is doing. That means there's going to be no distinction between Jew and Gentile, right? In the, in, in the, new, in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no distinction. Everything will be one. It will be one with God. So you want to approach what Paul is saying. And the reason it matters right here, he's talking in, in Galatians and he's talking to non-Jewish people. And he's saying there is neither Jew nor Greek as a reason to not go back to the Judaic law. He's not saying it because it's like we're done with that. He's saying because we are that, and God's actually called the Jewish people to move into this new thing called spirit-led. So if you're a forerunner in that, if you, if you accepted the Jewish Messiah, you're, it's not like you're discounting Judaism. You're, as a witness, going forward in Judaism. Does that make sense? This is very important because if you don't read it this way, you'll get the entirely wrong message from Galatians. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Everybody say heirs. Heirs. So Christians, according to Paul in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, when you put on Christ, you become an, a son, a, a, a offspring of Abraham and heirs according to his promises. Okay. So we're going to actually look at a second for a second at what the original promise to Abraham was. This is all things in one. Paul is preaching in Galatians, a unity gospel. And you'd be like, but it just sounds so like black and white, no Jewish old law. We're going into this faith thing, but he's actually showing us that this, these two things, there is an advancement, not an either or, like it matters or it doesn't matter. Okay, so Galatians is a defense of Gentiles being heirs to the promise. That's you, you're, you're Gentiles. Although in the flesh, it seems as though it's a dismissal, dismissal of Jewish heritage. It's not. Okay, so this is the promise that you are grafted into, that you're a seed of Abraham. If you believe, if, you, if Jesus is your leader, by the Spirit, everybody say by the Spirit. Now, Abraham was actually called to be led by the Spirit as well. Okay, you are called by faith to come out of your father's household to a place God will show you. This is part of the promise that, you're, that is yours. This is part of your inheritance. 
And I want you to think about that for a second. You're called to, you're, you're, you should be walking in a reality you don't know exactly where it's going, okay? You will become a great nation. Most people in the church here, nation of kings and priests, and have no idea what that means. That was the promise given to Abraham. That's a Jewish promise, priests and kings. You are called by faith to come out of your father's household to a place God will show you. I don't know why I repeated that twice. You become a great nation. Oh, I copied and pasted. So I got a little duplication here. You will be a blessing to the whole earth. Your, your promise from God is that if you stay in the leadership of Jesus in faith, your very life will be a blessing to the nations of the earth. You will be a target for Satan Be a people. People that do not want the kingdom of God to manifest because Satan is lying to them and, and manipulating them. They are guaranteed to make you a target. If you are following Jesus, you must be a target for people. If you are not a target, you are not following Jesus. God will bless those who bless you and curse anyone who curses you. And in you, all nations will be blessed. This is the promise made to Abraham that Paul's referring to in Galatians 3. Let's read Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord has, had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse the, him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so if you go back, let's go back to page one, the very bottom, the last verse there. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's the promise that Paul is talking about in Galatians 3. It's this Genesis 12, 1 to 3 promise. Now, when you say yes to this promise, God becomes your leader. You're actually more equipped to walk out this promise than people pre-Jesus because of the, the Holy Spirit. Is, it's only possible to walk this promise out via the Holy Spirit, you know, with the Holy Spirit empowering you and informing you. So when you say yes to this promise, God then becomes your leader. You have to hear God for this to occur. For all these promises to occur, you actually have to hear God. That's what Abraham's deal was. Abraham heard God. God was like, leave your father's house, come to a place I will show you. And in incredible faith, he believed this very strange direction to then start following this unknown God into a place he did not know where he was going. That's what you signed up for when you signed up for Jesus. Now, most American Christians don't realize that's what they're signing up for. They think they're signing up for Sunday morning church, better marriage, better family, maybe a little better finances, some peace in their hearts, and then someday some fire insurance. That's not what you signed up for. You signed up for a brand new leadership scheme that involves you not knowing exactly everything God is doing. Okay, that is the faith that, that Paul is laying out in Galatians, not some, you know what, I just believe everything's going to work out great for me because I said yes to Jesus and I don't have to do anything except for live my life and I don't have to do that old Jewish law because I'm saved by grace. That's what most people interpret as. That's a false gospel. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying you signed up for something so risky. You have to hear God. There's something to do to hear God. And if you don't do it, then you're actually, you might as well, you're just as dead as people that are trying to do this in the Jewish law in the flesh. The logical conclusion of what Paul's laying out is night and day prayer, okay? It's the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so when you say yes to this, you have to hear God for this to occur. Let's read Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. Now, this is God telling Jeremiah, this is the promise I'm making to rebellious Israel. I'm, I'm actually judging her so that she comes to this place where this happens. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now that is also you because you're grafted into the same root. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. What would we call that? If they made a promise and then they broke it, even though they were married. Adultery. Adultery or breaking the covenant. Exactly. So this is, this is the basis of Babylon right here. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this idea of Babylon and Israel, it goes all the way back to Abraham in this promise that we just read in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, where the, the Lord says to Abraham, 
come out of, the country he was in was Babylon. He's like, come out of Babylon and go to this place I'm going to show you. You don't know where it's at. Come out of your father's house. Trust me by faith. Yes, I know it looks dicey, but I'm going to make you a great nation. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Yes, you're going to be a target. Many are going to curse you. But anyone who curses you, I'm going to curse. Anyone who blesses you, I'm going to bless. And in you, all the nations will be blessed. In this witness that you can come out of Babylon. That's the point. So that's what, obviously, what the Lord's saying to Jeremiah here is he's saying, all right, Israel doesn't like coming out of Babylon. I'm going to send them back into Babylon, but with this promise that I'm going to someday lead them out, write my law on their heart. He's talking about the leadership of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit actually tells us in our mind, that's what your heart is, your mind, will, and emotions, what to do and how to obey God. Do you see what I'm saying? That's where we are right now. That's why we have to learn how to hear God and actually start letting him have our mind, will, and emotions. Because without that, you are Babylon. You were born Babylon. He's calling us out. He's always taking a people from a people. But many people in their minds, when they think about Babylon and the end times, they think, man, I don't want to get sucked into that Babylon thing. You are in the Babylon. It's coming. You have to come out. His people are in Babylon. You have to come out. That's what Galatians is laying out, is how to do that. Okay? Um. Jesus is king of the Jews. Let's read John 19, 19 to 21. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written, written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Okay, so Jesus, he is the one. He is the king of the Jews, and he is the son of David. He's the rightful king forever of Israel. He's fulfilling that Galatians 3, 26 to 29. So let's go back and just look at that for a second. On the page one of your notes at the bottom. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. That's what Jesus is doing. That's his job is to make us one, okay? So he's joining heaven and earth together. Everybody just do this for a second. You have to understand Galatians in this reality. Galatians is not a all about what you do on the earth. When you read it, it's very tempting to be like, that's, he's just talking about how to, you know, how to live a religious life, and you, you're not supposed to be subject to the, to, the, to the Mosaic law. You're supposed to be, you know, in faith, just receiving all this stuff. If you don't see that in this reality of heaven and earth coming together, you will take it in the flesh, and you will go off into apostasy or into a false gospel. That's what Paul keeps talking about, a false gospel in Galatians for us, because that's what the Galatians were doing. They were going into a false gospel, but the enemy is very crafty. When you read Galatians, the enemy wants you to read it in the flesh so that you yourself will go into a false gospel while reading the warning about not going into a false gospel. This is the same thing with 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Many people read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, which is a, Paul's main theological teaching on how to live spirit-filled and spirit-led speaking in tongues. And they use it as reasons to not speak in tongues in meetings, not let women teach, like, because they take it in the flesh. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you take Galatians in the flesh, it will put you in exactly the wrong place. You have to take it with the view of what Paul is describing is we have to be in this supernatural reality of reaching into heaven to get leadership. Not that we should be leadership less by, by discounting the law. We actually need to go deeper. So this is the thing. Many people think a theology of works is too burdensome, too laborious. Like that's a yoke God doesn't want on you, which is true. But the spirit led life is even more holy, more deep, more obedient. The true faith life requires more than the works life. Okay, but it's, it's tempting to think that's not the case. We'll be laying this out for the next five weeks, why that's true. But God isn't calling, he's never calling you to less holiness. He's always calling you to more. It's just you aren't capable of the holiness he requires for heaven. So what he wants is humility and meekness to say, I'm called to more holiness, but I can't do it, so I have to ask and receive it. That's what he's laying out in Galatians 5 when he starts talking about the spirit being at enmity with the flesh, the flesh being at war with the spirit. You don't do what you want to do. 
So you have to actually start asking the spirit to change who you are. So this is, yes, and it's, it's, it's a natural segue from the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what Sam's saying is this makes a lot of sense from the Sermon on the Mount. This is why the Sermon on the Mount is so important. The Sermon on the Mount is how we do Galatians. And the next thing we're going to talk about as a church on Friday nights is the relationship between Israel and the church. And you have to understand Galatians to understand the relationship the church is supposed to have with Israel. Okay, so let's read Ephesians 1, 7 to 12. Man, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Okay, so I want you to just pause for a second because it's easy to get lost. These are very familiar passages. This is a lot of familiar language. Oneness is the point of Galatians. Now, if you want proof of that, go back to Galatians 3, 26 to 29, where he says in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ. Ephesians is actually telling us this is the entire gospel is becoming one, no enmity between Jew and Gentile, like oneness, no enmity between men and women, oneness, no enmity in the earth, no war, like no uh, inequity, there's an economic oneness that's coming. All of these things are found in a spirit-led life. That's the point. Yeah, no generational enmity. That's it. So the answer to any problems we're having, you know, parent and kid, it's a oneness of the parent and a oneness of the kid with Christ who leads us deeper than the law. The law had a lot to say about parent-child relationships. The law had a lot to say about all of these realities. And to turn back to the law, it's lazy, right? Most people, when they think, oh, if they turn to the law, you're going to work too hard. No, it's actually lazy on the spirit. It's lazy on the spirit, hard on the flesh, very heavy weight on the flesh, lazy in the spirit. To turn to the Lord, a bit more work on the spirit but it lifts all the burdens off of the flesh, okay? And that's mostly what we see happening in the world right now is people are, are struggling under the weight of the flesh. And the answer is to take the weight off the flesh and put it on the spirit because the spirit is actually joined together right now with God's spirit. He can bear the weight. You can't, okay? And the more judgment comes, the harder and harder and harder it is going to be to grit your teeth and resist sin. You're going to actually give in if you don't actually get under the leadership of the Spirit where he bears up that burden of holiness. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now what that last sentence means, and the reason I underlined it, is we're supposed to be witnesses that turning to the Lord, having the veil removed. So first, second Corinthians 318 lays this out where it says the law of Moses, like Israel reads the law of Moses. They can't understand what it's saying because they're reading it in the flesh. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. We start to see him as we're seen. And then we start to behold and become like him. That's how the spirit actually leads us. It's just describing the tabernacle of David. That's what David instructed the singers and musicians in his tabernacle to do. He said, I want you to come. You're going to pray and sing. You have to sing prophetically. You actually have to look upon the Lord and sing prophetically. I don't want you singing anything but prophecies. And that's what they did. They prophesied to music in David's tabernacle. That is the freedom the, the salvation by faith that Paul's laying out in Galatians is this very same oneness or this freedom. Do you get, are you guys following me? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Okay. So we have to understand that we're supposed to be witnesses. Who are we supposed to be witnesses to in this age? Do you guys know? The unsaved world. That's a good answer. Definitely that's part of it. But what's the main object? Who is God trying to provoke jealousy? Is he trying to provoke jealousy in the world? Jews, that's right, because Jesus will not return until Israel invites him back, and Jesus is not okay with all the death happening on the earth right now. He doesn't feel good about it. 
though he feels good about his, what he's allowing to happen, he wishes that no one would perish is what the Bible says. God desires none should perish. So in his heart, he's like, I want Israel to get a witness of the spirit filled life of Israel. We're Jewish, right? We're grafted into that Jewish root. We're supposed to in humility say, I should give my life to the spirit led life that Israel would get a witness that her God reigns. I'm describing to you Isaiah 62. That's what the, his, your, Israel, your sons and daughters going to marry you. They're married to the city of Jerusalem. They're going to say in Isaiah 50, 52, your God reigns as they sing night and day and see eye to eye. Do you get what I'm saying? Isaiah is actually talking about us. Is this talking about a Jewish remnant that gets spirit led, the law written on them as a witness that all of Israel would be saved. You are that witness if you signed up for Jesus. That's the point. And that's what Paul is laying out in Galatians is if you go backward, you're not only are you not going to be helpful in saving yourself, you're not going to be helpful in saving anyone else. You're no witness of what Judaism is actually about. Do you get what I, all right. Am I beating it to death? Okay, so let's read. This oneness is a very specific reality given to Jesus and his bride. The oneness that Galatians is laying out, the oneness that Ephesians is laying out, the oneness Isaiah is laying out, the oneness we just read about in Jeremiah where he says, I'll write my law on their hearts. He's not going to do that apart from his plan to do that, which is to raise up a witness that it's possible so that Israel would want it. That's the whole point of spiritual jealousy. So if we don't become a witness of God writing his law in our hearts, then how will they know if it's not preached? Like I'm quoting to you Romans 11 again, that the relationship of Israel to the church is we're supposed to be a witness to Israel as we put ourselves in that Jewish root. We're like, this is what we're supposed to do, Israel. But we don't discount Israel. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so let's read John 17, 18 to 23. Now he's speaking to entirely Jewish people in this passage. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sake sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in, in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them as you have loved me. Now, what's funny is that when New Testament or, you know, believers, not modern believers, read about James and John and Paul and Matthew and those guys, they think that they're one of us. They're, they're, those guys are like us. But they would have been thinking about us if they could see forward in the future. They're going to be Jewish like us. We think they're, those are the Christians. And they're like, oh, there's going to be some Jewish people like us that are going to say yes to this Jewish Messiah. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus is looking in a room full of Jewish people and saying, I want you guys all one. Now, when Gentiles first started to get saved, the Jewish people, the first church, had no idea what to do with these Gentiles. Like, they, that, they didn't know that's what Jesus was saying. So if you were like, I didn't know that's what he was saying, don't take it too hard. Nobody knows this until you start getting into the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And then he starts telling Peter, Peter, nothing's unclean. I want you to go to Cornelius. And then Peter's like, okay, when I'm with Cornelius, I'm kind of acting like a Gentile. But when I'm with the Jewish guys, I'm kind of acting like a Jewish guy. And then Paul's like, Peter, that's incongruent. That's what's happening in Acts 15, where Paul is like, it's a lie. Are we supposed to call them into the Jewish law or are we supposed to go forward into what? The tabernacle of David. That's what Acts 15 lays out. So that's the two choices. We either go back to the law of Moses, to the tabernacle of Moses, or we go forward to the tabernacle of David. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's Jesus is the root and offspring of David. He's going to sit on David's throne. So if you said a yes to Jesus, what you said yes to was going forward as Israel, with Israel, as a witness to Israel in the humility that you don't replace Israel. This is a very narrow place that I'm describing. That the tabernacle of David is about freedom to be led by the Holy Spirit. So you can't do that if you're not living as a witness that you make your day-to-day -day choices by what the Holy Spirit tells you. You with, you with me? This is very difficult. What I'm saying is difficult. If you're not hearing like, oh my word, mostly I'm not living as a witness of the Spirit-filled life. 
something touches my money, I get into the flesh, I call Dave Ramsey, what do I do about my money? The Holy Spirit has something to say about your money. I get in trouble with my, with my kids, I look up the book, you know, what did the guy from Focus on the Family say about how to deal with kids? That's not spirit-led. It can be used by the Spirit. I'm not discounting the fact that there's not good wisdom in the book by the guy from Focus on the Family, but that's not Spirit-led. Just like there's great value in the law if you're led by the Spirit when you read it, but you can't do it without the Spirit. So there's this whole part of our lives, and we're like, well, that's the real part of my life. I got to make decisions. The guy gave me a brain to use it. No, he gave you a brain to put it at his feet, to offer it to him. He gave you a heart to offer it to him. And that's what Paul is laying out in Galatians, okay? So to be part of the fulfillment of this prayer that Jesus prays in John 17, we are called to a oneness with Jesus. This is what Galatians is laying out systematically. Do you hear that I keep saying this is what Galatians is laying out? In a nutshell, it's laying out a spirit-led life, okay? Now we can only become one with Jesus and each other by drinking the one spirit. That's the spirit Jesus gave. When, he, when Jesus offered his spirit on the cross, he said, into your hands, God, I commit, I commit my spirit. God took Jesus' offering and broke it up like the loaves of bread and the fish. And then he hands it out and it never runs out because his, Jesus' spirit is infinite. His broken spirit on the cross is like the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, but you have to eat it. You actually, he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot be my disciple. That's what he's talking about. You have to eat it. You have to actually say, this is my food. This is my drink. This is how I make decisions. This is how I live or die. I don't know. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into that fire. I don't know what he's going to do. Remember Abraham called into a place. You don't know what's going to happen, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to do whatever the spirit says to do. I don't know how it's going to work out for me, but that's what I'm going to do. And he will meet you in that fire every single time. That's the witness he wants to give to Israel. So you need some trouble to walk into with the spirit. You need some conflict in your home. You need some trouble at work. You need some trouble with money just so you can be a witness. Do you see what I'm saying? We, we've been, we've been sold a gospel that's so false that says you're not going to have any of these troubles. If you say yes to Jesus, he's going to multiply those troubles so he can take you through them as a witness. So he can show Israel. You don't have to align with Political kings, you don't have to, you know, sell your, your, the stuff out of the temple to another king so he'll come and protect you. I mean, these are all the stories from the Bible. Do you get what I'm saying? We're literally witnessing the church go headlong into the flesh right now. You got to come out. Babylon is emerging. The end time Babylon is emerging. You got to come out. You're in it if you're not coming out of it. That's the point of Galatians. Okay. Now, let's read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. What's the only way to be part of this one body? One spirit washing over you. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. Now, do you see this theme over and over? Jews or Greeks, oneness, God's getting rid of the enmity. It's always related to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that is going to erase all of the division that's in the earth right now is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. There is no man that can come take it away. There is no law that's going to fix it. There is, I mean, enmity between, between the generations that Jen mentioned One of the fruits of that enmity is abortion. What's going to erase abortion is not a law. It's not a politician. It's the Holy Spirit leading us as witnesses that you don't have to compromise your morals to have your life work out okay. I mean, that's what these young women or, you know, people that are tempted to have an abortion, they're mostly witnessless all over the earth that you can trust God no matter what your problem is and face that thing headlong and it's going to work out for you. When the church is like, if we don't get this guy to do this thing, then everything's lost. What does that say to somebody that's going to have an abortion? There is no God. There's no God that can save your baby. You better do what's best for you. God's looking for a witness, not a witness that stands on the street and tells people how awful they are if they kill babies. A witness that says, I can't do my life on my own. I need the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you all the ways that the Spirit has saved me from my own mistakes, my own trouble, the stuff that I caused myself. That's an entirely different witness. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. And have all been made to drink into one spirit. So it's this one spirit. It's the body emerging. 
at, at the leadership of Jesus, not speculating what he wants, not in the flesh trying to do what he wants, but in real time hearing him and obeying him. Okay, that's a, that's a witness that the earth is lacking right now. But it's starting to emerge right now. It's starting to emerge. So to try and do any of the agreement with the Bible in the flesh is to become antichrist. That is what, that's why Paul is saying this to the Galatians, okay? Because they're, they're actually tempted to try and do righteousness in the flesh. That's, that is the basis of an antichrist spirit. Okay, so if you try to resist sin through human will, that is the basis of the antichrist spirit. Now, you have to put some asterisks on this. You only start resisting sin in the flesh. There's no other way to start. But as the Lord shows himself to you, you're supposed to give more and more of the responsibility to the Lord. It's everybody starts off in the flesh. But that's why Paul is talking to the Galatians. like, you foolish Galatians, why are you turning around? I've, you've been coming out of the flesh. You've been coming out of Babylon. Why do you want to go back into it? So don't get condemned if you're like, I've mostly been resisting sin in the flesh. That's great. That's way better than not resisting sin. You can't do it, though, to the level God wants it. And we're getting back to the Sermon on the Mount. So cleansing by ritual instead of relationship. If you trust in a ritual to make you clean, that's the flesh. You can't, it, that's actually going backwards into Jude, like the Judaic law. Even if you're, you know, like if you're in Catholicism, you're like, you know, I just said the Hail Marys and now I'm clean. I mean, if you didn't connect with God's leadership in doing that, you're not clean. Okay. Now bring righteousness through human force. That's unclean. That, that, it, you, that is antichrist to bring righteousness through human force, through politics, military, or shaming people into righteousness. That's the flesh. Now we mostly relate to our kids by shaming them into righteousness. We have to repent of this. We should be giving them a witness that I am unrighteous and it's only the leadership of the Holy Spirit that's making me more righteous. But it's just lazy to be like, if you do that, you're going to hell, or God doesn't like that, or, you know, if you do that, that's terrible. And what does God think about that? Well, he thinks the same thing about it as he thinks about it when you do it. Like, we have to give a witness that there's a spirit-led reality and that we get free in it and everybody starts in sin. There's, we whip by, this is what he said to the Pharisees. You put, by, you put weights on people. You don't lift a finger to take it off. You're doing all this in the flesh. He says, do what they say. Do what, he said, do what the Pharisees say, but don't do what they do. Because they put weights on people, and they don't lift a finger to take it off. Okay? Uh, bring equity through human reason. If you try to do that, if you try to distribute resources just because you got a good idea, and there's lots of this happening, clean water, orphans, like tons of the church in the flesh, trying to fix earthly problems and not repenting in day and night prayer and saying, God, we need you to come and avenge your own elect. To bring unity through compromise instead of sanctification, that's the flesh. If you're making alliances, political alliances, to bring peace instead of wholeheartedly being sanctified unto God, you're, you're basically violating every lesson in the Old Testament about when a Jewish king was attacked by another king. If you try to bring peace through compromise, you're increasing division, not helping it. And the like. Okay, let's read Galatians 5, 16 to 26. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now, this is, the, this is the, one of the primary pinnacles of the book of Galatians. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Good intention, intention people. Oh, this is this. A, a note by me. I should have made it a different color. You Sorry. have to read it then. Uh, good intention people are Babylon and the Antichrist. So I want you to pay attention where it says, when you're walking in the flesh and not the spirit, he says, the things of the flesh, they're contrary to one to the spirit so that you don't do the things that you wish. He's saying you have good intentions. You actually want to do the good thing. He's not talking about a bunch of people that don't want to do good things. He's saying you want to do the good thing, but when you do it in the flesh, you're actually fighting the Holy Spirit. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So what we could just paraphrase this and say, if you're doing what you think is the right thing and it's resulting in these things in your heart or the people around you, then you're actually in the flesh. Though you have great intentions, though you want to do the holy thing, the fruit of doing the flesh thing is this stuff. Do you see a lot of this stuff in the earth right now around the church? Yes, a ton of it right now. Like adultery, fornication, pouring out of the church right now. Like massive leaders in the church getting caught in like very 
unbelievable adulterous affairs. I mean, I, I'm not even going to name any examples, but there's many in the news even in the last few weeks. This is because of the flesh. Now, it's attempting to look at the guy that cheated on his wife and got kicked out of the church, not a pastor anymore, and be like, you know, that guy had some bad intentions. According to the Bible, he probably actually had really good intentions. But he was trying to do them in his own strength. And if we teach our kids to grit their teeth and do it in their own strength, that's what we're signing them up for. So we have to just be a people that are like, I'm going hard after the Holy Spirit's leadership, and I want my kids to follow me. I don't want to try to force them in the flesh like I was forced in the flesh. Broken people break other people. We have to be the people that are like, I repent. I'm actually just going to live as a burning, shining lamp for my kids. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't parent them, that we don't tell them right from wrong, that we don't admonish them, that we don't correct them, but it means that we're always doing it with an eye to I need to be spirit-led in all of these things. There is no fleshy formula that's not going to produce more brokenness is the point of this, okay? Um, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in t- just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, the, the flip side of this is, I don't know, Tom, am I in the flesh or am I in the spirit? I don't know, God, am I in the flesh or am I in the spirit? I don't know. Was that thing that I was thinking, I thought all those people were against me. Was that the spirit telling me? I got afraid. I started to tell other people, I think those people are against us. That's the flesh. You can tell by what it's producing inside of you. If it's peace, okay, all these people are lining up against me, but I know the Lord's going to protect me. I don't need to align a bunch of people against them. That's probably the spirit that's highlighting that to you because the fruit that it's producing in you is peace. But if it's, oh my gosh, these people are coming against us. What are we going to do? Let's get together. Let's resist them. That's not the Holy Spirit because of the fruit that it's producing in you. You see what I'm saying? That's how you know. And that's what Paul's laying out here. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, we're going to wrap up here. We walk in the spirit by the Sermon on the Mount, repenting where we don't walk in the spirit. That's how you walk in the spirit. The only way you can walk in the spirit is by telling God, I'm not okay where I don't walk in the spirit. You can't produce a spirit-led life apart from the spirit. Abriel, you want to come back up? The first resurrection is only a promise for the sanctified witnesses that walk in the spirit. That's the point. If you want to take part in the rapture when Jesus returns, then you have to actually sign up for spirit-led life at the level of detail the Sermon on the Mount is laying out. Now, witness, that word is martyr in the Greek. It's martis, witness. It's someone who suffers persecution and death for advocating, advocating, renouncing, and refusing to renounce or refusing to advocate a religious belief or cause as demanded by an external party. That means if you're a witness, you're a martyr. If you're a martyr, you're a witness. Okay, Revelation 20, 4 to 6. This is the last thing we're going to read. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this is the point of the great cloud of witnesses and those who are waiting to be perfected with us. Jesus is actually, there's a reason that Jesus is the only man in heaven with a resurrected body. He doesn't want his bride to, to be resurrected apart from the rest of the bride. He's, there's actually a cloud of witnesses in heaven that gave it all to live spirit-led. They were, they were Jewish witnesses. That's what Hebrews 11 is laying out. And Hebrews 12 says, because of that, let us put aside every weight, every sin, 
and let's run our race. If you want that, let's stand together. This is the faith that Paul's talking about. It's not faith to do nothing. It's faith to help to let God help you do everything that you read about in the Bible. It's just incongruent to think. The faith God's calling me to is a completely different life than I read about every faithful person in the Bible. But that's the most common understanding in our day. If you want to come out of that, if you want some vision to give Jesus everything, I think he wants to give us eyes to see tonight. What real faith looks like in the Bible. We're going to be talking about this for the next several weeks, but we need vision. If you want that, let's just raise our hands before the Lord. God, we're just lifting up our hands in your sanctuary. We want to be a blessing to you. We want to bless you, God. We don't want to come here and contaminate your sanctuary. We can't make ourselves clean, and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we can't make ourselves clean, and we thank you that you want to. So tonight, Lord, we're just asking you, would you touch our eyes? Would you start, God, with the way that we see life, what we're, what we're signing up for for the coming months and years, Lord? I'm just asking we'd make a new commitment tonight in the way we deal with our families. Lord, that we'd be spirit-led. I just thank you. There's so much knowledge in this room about the right things to do. But we want to connect that knowledge to the Spirit's leadership. Lord, that we don't have to pick one or the other. We can actually let the Spirit inform what we already know. Would you come right now, Lord? Would you start to talk to us about what you did with Abraham when you took him from his father's house? What you did with Noah when he started to build that boat? What you did, God, with Jesus who learned obedience. God, what you did with Rahab, that whole litany of faith, God, we know some things that you want to use, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you help us to not discount one for the other? That we give you our hearts, we give you our mind, will, and emotions, what's in here already, so you can start using it in power. In the name of Jesus, amen. my 